compelling reason, Bhaktisiddhanta said, any time is the right time. Now is the right time. Circumstantially, things of this world are ever-changing. What is today is different tomorrow and is different the next day and is different than it was yesterday. Circumstances don't create opportunity for spiritual well-being. Rather, the conviction that spiritual well-being must be experienced by all and having the right means for doing that is appropriate at any time. Any time is auspicious. Now is the time. and it's The situation in the world is very difficult. It's Kali Yuga and degradation is expanding rapidly and so many compelling arguments. So, our spiritual master, our founder of ISKCON said, I was always good at debate, but I was happy to be defeated. And I felt convinced this person, this person I just met, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, he is a very capable bearer of this wonderful message. And he said, in my heart I accepted him as my spiritual master. And he carried that message with him for his entire household life. He had several other children. He fulfilled his household obligations. His um, business was in pharmaceuticals. And he had become a very wealthy person in India at that time. And by because of those household duties, he was feeling, I can't do so much service. So he wrote to his spiritual master another time, much later, and said, I'm a grahasta. I have so many duties. Your sannyas disciples can do so much full-time service for you. Is there some service that I can also do for you? And this was in December of 1937, literally days before um, Bhaktisiddhanta departed from this world, his disappearance day as we're honoring today, he wrote back a letter. It said the same thing as their first meeting. It said, there is some very nice service you can do. You can go to the English-speaking parts of the world and deliver the message of Lord Chaitanya, and this will be good for you and good for them. Same message, hadn't changed over all those years. So, and that was the last communication that he received from his spiritual master. Some days later, it was January 1st, 1937, at 5.20 in the morning, he left this world. And so here's our spiritual master receiving this message feeling, how can I do this? I'm just one person and I'm old and I have responsibilities and you know all those things that people think. Irresponsible. So in course of time, his sons became old enough to take care of the family business. He turned the business over to those sons. He went to Vrindavan to prepare himself further for this assignment that he had been given by his spiritual master. He took it as a personal direction from him. He prepared his commentary on Bhagavad Gita, a manuscript that had not been published. And he published the first canto in three volumes of Srimad Bhagavatam. And, long story, much um, struggle, because he was penniless as a renunciate at that stage of his life. But the books were published and he got free passage on a cargo ship going from Calcutta to New York. Cynthia steam lines and Mrs. Mirarji 
arranged for his, in the, in the cargo ship there was a little cabin, little tiny little space, and off he went to America. When he was in America, as Prabhupada said, when he walked off the gangplank, the departure uh, steps to get off the boat, I didn't know whether to turn left or turn right. Meaning, he his entrance into the U.S. was by a um, tourist visa. Because prior to that, 1965, it was the post-war era, and there were, people couldn't get visas. And just at that time, the restriction on visas was changed. And it's a little story here, but one business friend of his, um, Mr. Agarwal, had a son who lived in Butler, Pennsylvania. Butler, Pennsylvania is in the middle of nowhere. They have a nice basketball team, but other than that, it's, it, nobody knows about Butler, Pennsylvania. So, he asked Mr. Agarwal, could you arrange for your son to give me a sponsorship letter? And his son wrote the sponsorship letter, and so Prabhupada received the sponsorship letter. And he submitted it to the American consulate and got his visa. And he got a passage to go to America on the boat. So when he entered America, you know, where do you find Butler, Pennsylvania when you're in New York City? And he didn't have a f cell phone. He didn't have a phone number. He didn't have any money in his pocket. He was penniless. He had whatever the number of rupees, 40 rupees, that he can't use in America anyways. So, he stayed for a while, got on a bus to Butler, Pennsylvania, stayed with the Agarwals for some time, came back to the US, lived in Manhattan. It was, it was long, wonderful narration of how Krishna gave him challenges to test his determination and eventually some little beginning started in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. One of the reasons I'm narrating this is just to appreciate um, what incredible effort our founder Achari went through. On the, on the boat crossing he had two heart attacks because at that time he was 70 years old. Think of somebody you know that's 70 years old. And imagine that person getting on a cargo boat, going around India from Calcutta to Bombay and then through the Suez Canal and through the Mediterranean and across the Atlantic Ocean where it's you know, not just calm, it's big, big, big waves. And he had two heart attacks. He nearly died. To, to come to the, the West, to meet a bunch of people that he didn't even know, to fulfill the message, to fulfill the order of a spiritual master, to give this message. And then an incident happened where his manuscript that he had not yet published for Bhagavad Gita was stolen by a crazy person. Broke into his room, stole his manual typewriter. At that time, it wasn't even the electric typewriter. That was just the manual, press the keys and, you know, the that kind of typewriter. They stole the manual typewriter and his Bhagavad Gita manuscript. What's a, what's a person <coughs> going to do with the Bhagavad Gita manuscript? <coughs> so he had to write it over again. All over again. That was how he did. And one of the messages of the introduction I just read to you. And then slowly he began presenting Krishna consciousness at a little storefront. And if you sometime <coughs> go to New York City, you can visit the place. It's, they call it the place where it all began. 26 Second Avenue. It's a little, it's like a, shaped like a subway car. It's, you know, long and narrow. 
little window in the front, store window in the front, and long narrow space, rectangular space. In the back corner is a little bathroom, a little toilet and sink, and next to that is where Prabhupada would sit, and the place would fill up with people who three nights a week would come and hear Kirtan and his discussion on Bhagavad Gita and take prasadam. And that's how it began. So after some time, maybe you've seen videos of those early days where Prabhupada is chanting and people are dancing and um, hearing. It was, a, it was a very intimate time because the, the proximity, the intimacy with Srila Prabhupada was, he was like everything for them. He was their father, he was their...